Ladies and gentlemen, it is 10 after. Spotify is going away. I'm here. Slides are here. You're here. Let's do this thing. So today's lecture, as was mentioned uh, in the discussion post, sorry, not discussion post, in the announcement, is the second last, which makes us all quite sad. Um, but we're going to have some fun, hopefully, today. Uh, I'm going to do something I don't usually do, which is go live on software in front of students when I haven't actually tested it, because, you know, why not? Uh, but let's just start by doing sort of a, a review of what's happening around the world that's relevant to engineering design. And I thought we'd start here. Um, this is um, going to be using Twitter a bunch. Uh, so people are now looking, you know, if you can find a simpler mask to make, I'd love to hear it. Um, and, you know, this is a, a multi-stage. This one, I believe, is a 13-stage uh, technique. Does involve cutting, does involve sewing, uh, does involve, um, you can kind of see it over here. Uh, it does involve an actual nose piece. So, you know, but I, I like, you know, Lauren Richter, whoever she is, is like, can you find something simpler? And I think uh, the internet said, yes, yes, we can. So I thought this was kind of awesome. Um, and I do like the fact that, you know, one of the things that's been commented on is this is now an international, uh, or it's always been, but it's really now seen as an international uh, opportunity for people to support each other, to provide ideas. Um, whereas before, you know, Japan was perhaps known for Grumpy Cat on Twitter. Um, now it's known for all sorts of other cool things, including this. Um, this particular design is kind of neat. Uh, I'm not going to show the video, um, but if you search, all I did was search for no, no sew mask. And this is one of the ones that came up. And effectively, it's just a multi-folded towel. Um, you can see that there's two um, hair bands, hair elastics. So not hair bands, hair elastics. Um, and basically, you fold the tea towel over itself to get enough layers. You put the elastics on, fold it back around, and you're good to go. Now, keeping in mind that this particular design, as with many of these designs, is doing the part where it hooks around the ear as opposed to hooking around the head. So you are applying more force to the ears than otherwise. But, you know, kind of neat, no sewing, which for people like myself and those of you who don't have sewing machines, it's kind of neat that people are going there. Um, and if you're really retro, you can combine Twitter with the newspaper. And so this was in the New York Times uh, for Wednesday, April 1. So a couple days ago, I think. Yep, five days ago. Um, and they actually printed in real size, so one-to-one -one scale, how to sew a face mask. Again, requires the sewing. Um, and then, you know, Center for Disease Control. There's been some issues and concerns about Center for Disease Control. But I find this really neat because it's kind of merging um, old school, new school. It's old school media with, you know, current kind of events all shown on Twitter, which is kind of cool. Um, although it wasn't shown on Twitter by the New York Times. Um, but in terms of drawing, this is actually really important because what, what is really nice about this is it is literally one-to-one -one scale. So you just take the newspaper, put it down, and you are good to go to have things sized appropriately. Admittedly, one-to-one -one scale is great, but for which user? who wh Whose head is this size? And that's one of those points that you always have to be careful of when you start to do things and put your designs out there. Okay, now things get interesting, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so uh, first things first, um, this is Olin faculty. So Olin College is a uh, university, a uh, private university outside of Boston, um, about half an hour away. And it was known for being founded by a guy named Franklin Olin, who basically gave it a huge endowment so that students never had to pay tuition. Now, that lasted three years, and now they do. Um, but, but Olin is really known for, for trying to be innovative in engineering design. So Olin faculty member uh, Elizabeth Johansson, dot, dot, dot. Uh, key point here, 3D printed face shield recommended by the National Institute of Health, NIH. But it says more. So let's do more. OK, first question for the collective. What do you notice about the headline? Collective, talk to me. Um, 
no name, Hanover woman, not descriptive. Um, yeah, like you're kind of sitting here going, you know, granted, this is from a, a local Hanover paper, but it's not Hanover professor. It's not, you know, local entrepreneur. It's hand over, hand, hand, hand over woman. So, okay, so first things first, when you are writing headlines, when you're describing things, be very careful about how you're privileging and deprivileging people. I mean, I, at the very least, it should be a handover professor in this case. All right, so let's, let's, let's take a look. So, uh, da, 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 uh, conducting research, totally a fan. Interviewing clinicians, totally a fan. Reading medical journals, and I think we're off on one of those. So the reading medical journals should be highlighted. It might come back later, but I'll highlight it now because I have the technology. So conducting research, interviewing clinicians, reading medical journals. Now, capable of being printed anywhere, assembled with supplies bought from office stores. So as someone who teaches engineering design, I'm looking at this going, I like the research, I like the clinicians. I like this idea of um, manufacturing assembly a little bit. So I'm feeling good, feeling good. So we zoom in and so she, she's getting her old team back together. And as it says, she drove, dove into the clinical literature and the regulatory requirements. So the stuff that you know we've been telling you to do, which is go find out what those who are between you and your stakeholders, those intermediate stakeholders who can stop you, find out what they have to say as well as the clinical literature. All right, I'm gonna turn this into a quick question. Uh, new face shield was based on one design in the Czech Republic. That is an example of using Go Mattermost and Discord and wherever else you're chatting. Come on. Reference designs. Awesome. So yeah, there, it's a great reference design, noting though that it's dealing with the specifics of the coronavirus. And so here's the, the thing that I think is really super cool. So as it says, originally it was just a shield piece of plastic. Doing her research, Johansson found this article that basically figured out, okay, when someone coughs, what's the spray pattern not just in 2D, but also in 3D and also over time. As it says, up into the air, then back down towards healthcare workers' eyes. So their conclusion, more than just front, you're going to need to deal with the fact that stuff's hopping over. Okay. And as it says, now it's an inverted sun visor design. Excuse me. So um, also a few other things, though. So she also realized that you know CDC originally said that when you do a face shield, you're going to be disposing after each use. So the regulations framed up or assumed slash framed a very particular situation, namely oodles of stuff disposed because that gives you speed. Right? If you don't have to clean it, you don't need all the equipment to clean it. You can just get rid of it and go again. So there's a distinction where they say, okay, well, but that's not the current situation. Nowadays, given the, the circumstances, you need something that can last longer, be more durable. The other thing that's really important is this notion that it's basically, as she says, it's just a report cover. And so the idea that she believes and, and her design team believes is that those covers can be found anywhere. So if the supply chain gets kind of wonky, you're still going to be able to go. Okay, cool. So we've got a bunch of different features. We've got some things we like to see. And we can compare and contrast standard technique with what we talked about in lecture 32, where this uh, director of the engineering design innovation lab, you know, put his kids to bed, went to Home Depot, grabbed some stuff and started going, then gave it to, to his wife to check early validation. So your low fidelity prototyping, your early validation, um, then the iteration, and then, and then finally getting and looking and doing a little more research. So we have two very different approaches by these two groups. And so here's, here's what we're trying to do in praxis as we show you all these things, especially <clears throat> as you think about your handbook and your own positionality. So on the one hand, a few hours in the library, um, and it's hours saved, because why hack away in your lab or in your machine shop when you can actually get in there and actually read up on what people have suggested, find the reference designs and so on. And in her particular case, Johansson, as it says, found this article and that article gives her design a very unique niche because it's actually protecting in a way that is aware of how the virus particles are flying through the air. Now, on the other hand, 
a few hours in the lab or the shop uh, can save so much time because you've all done this. You search and you search and you search and it might be there and it might not be there, but the internet has everything and Google can find everything. And it's really hard to say, you know what? Maybe it doesn't actually exist. But because you're doing it physically, because you're playing with it in the physical, not the abstract, you can help find that unique niche. So you can kind of tell by the fact that I used a parallel construction and the thing that Praxis has been talking all around about balance and iteration. What we're going to tell you, and so at least suggest to you, that the, the approach you want to take as an engineering designer, keeping in mind, these are both engineering people. One of them is the director of the Engineering Design Innovation Lab, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Ms. Johansson in a second. You want to acknowledge there's value in the shop. There's value in the lab. And I know that there's a few people listening going, Foster does not truly believe this. And I do, I just am not very good in the shop or the lab. There's value there, but there's also value in the research, in the reference designs, in the library that's there as well. And so you got to value both. You got to do both. And, and to those people who are like, well, Foster sucks in the lab and he's all theory. Um, why don't we team up? Right. We'll bounce back and forth. You'll spend a little more time in the lab, but you'll teach me labs, lab and shop stuff. And I'll help you with the research because like I'm really I enjoy the words and, and trying to like sneakily find stuff and doing booleans. So we can team up and in our team, we can mutually skill up in the areas that we're not strong. So research, definitely lab and shop. Definitely. The key in both cases, though, is you find the niche because the niche is going to be really important. I'd say any questions, but you know, so far so good. One is hack research and others research design that works and eventually the hack becomes the design and it all just kind of happens okay so let's go back to ms johansson and uh let's let's see what else has been happening in the wide world of face shields and here's tim cook and again we're not going to show the video um but notice how as it says our design engineering operations and packaging teams are also working with suppliers to design produce and ship face shields so he's also doing face shields. Apple's in the face shields. Uh, Professor Pre Professor Sheridan calls me on this, and well, rightly so. I'm going to say it's uh, Professor Johansson. Okay, so here's Tim Cook, and we're not even going to listen to him. But now we've got this really interesting situation where Olin College, one of the top engineering schools, it's rated in the top three or four of its size all the time. Apple, one of the top product design firms in the nation, and they have produced two very different designs. Um, you'll notice that it says adjustable uh, under the, the caption. He also talks in his video about flat pack, which is basically you can, you can pack them flat, sort of like Ikea furniture, and two minute assembly. So this, when Tim Cook is describing Apple and as CEO, it's kind of like his, so to speak, approach and things that they valued, adjustable flat pack, two minute assembly. Professor Johansson says, look, I want this thing to be washable. I want this thing to be reusable. And I want it to provide this extra protection that's informed by the research. Okay, cool. Different designs. But then things get interesting. Tim Cook, prior to being CEO, was the person who basically ran everything to do with manufacturing, supply chain, and logistics for Apple. Uh, he is largely credited with being the reason that not only did Apple design cool stuff, they actually could ship it very, very efficiently, very effectively, and very quickly. Professor Johansson, uh, she runs a company that, as it says, specializes in more accessible. And if you take into account um, different um, definitions of accessibility, it all um, that also gets into what she teaches, which is this notion of affordable design and entrepreneurship. So for her, given her background, again, I'm hypothesizing, I don't know her full history, it sounds like affordable also probably means not disposable, accessible probably means more usable. We're getting no sound on Twitch. Uh, we'll, do, we'll debug that in a sec. Um, so both of these individuals came from a particular background and both of them influenced the design of their visor. So. If it's not perfectly clear by now, your positionality impacts your design. When you see the world as manufacturing supply chain logistics, 
you make a flat pack, easy to assemble, and you put some usability in, adjustable. If you see the world as affordable and accessible, then it's washable in protection. I will also point out the function, intercept virus particulates, virus-laden particulates is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So someone, uh, Professor Sheridan commented, uh, the notion of a niche. And when I say niche, I guess what I'm trying to say, or what I'm using it in, in context, it's to say that little spot in the design space, so to speak, that's your specialty. It's the thing that you do that others don't, that some people will value. So you're kind of, you're, you're neat. So, so Foster's niche is highly integrated design theory lecturing, right? I bring things together. I integrate them kind of like this. That's my niche. Other people's niche in the context of, you know, teaching design might be more on process, might be more on, um, might be more on process, might be more on um, analysis. That niche, though, is the thing that you become known for that distinguishes you from others. <laughs> okay, so function necessary, not sufficient. I'll also point out, for those interesting, uh, we're into makers again. Uh, there's this notion, Kenyan makers respond to COVID-19. And they sort of have set it up where you, you uh, as, as a medical professional, you can request fate or medical worker, you can request the shields and you can kind of see their design. This is what they're, they're showing as a, as a rendering. And why choose these shields? Well, number one, assembly. Number two, shipping. Number three, assembly. Number four, manufacturing. Number five, usability-ish. Number six, ergonomics. So there's a lot of stuff here that sounds pretty good. Now, now again, I would, be, I would say the same to Tim Cook if I ever got a chance to talk with him. I would say the same to Professor Johansson. Some metrics and uh, some verification would be nice. Now, it sounds like the one thing they can verify is the manufacturing time. But if you're going to make claims like this, we want to see them. Speaking of verification, these are at a very pictorial level. Uh, these are the one pages that were submitted. Uh, so we've got them all. We've collected them all. Thank you for those uh, who submitted. Um, looking kind of interesting. Um, lots of different approaches, different styles. You've got your landscape, you got your portrait, you got your trifold. Um, and we love it that there is this diversity because we, one, we want you to own your work. Um, and two, it's really important to us as you can kind of get uh, with, with the positionality, the work embodies you, that you can kind of see yourself in, in how this was done. So one of the things um, that the teaching team is, is considering uh, there is no no showcase. There is no sort of opportunity for everyone to kind of see what others have done on the same RFP on different RFPs. Um, so one of the things we're considering is is posting these um, in a public location, like on the on the well not public public on a, on a location that you can all access. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on, um, but we have Mattermost and and so on to have that discussion. But it's something that we. We don't want to put people out who are not comfortable or put people's work out that they're not comfortable sharing. But by the same token, Showcase was kind of like that where you, you present it. So uh, something to consider, something to ponder. I'm going to move on. So uh, as we announced last night, we have the two assignments. We're going to talk to them, um, talk about them and to them and ask, uh, address your questions a little bit. Um, one thing we'll say, the IIT for the detailed design decision is just very similar to the PER, and uh, the teaching team has already been working on that, so it's an adaptation. It should be ready shortly. Um, and then we're going to do the IIT for verification a little bit afterwards. Uh, one thing I, has already been mentioned, um, Tuesday's lecture is the last of the term. Um, it uh, It's sort of a, a recap prelude. It talks about where you've been. It talks about where you're going. Um, and it does, uh, you know, I try, I try to go with the memes of my generation. Uh, so, and, and ideally sort of yours as well. Um, but uh, there's some stuff there that we think you'll enjoy. The other thing is that studio check-ins uh, will be happening this week. But in addition, we're adding sort of a, a general session. Um, where, what we're trying to do is recreate that opportunity that, that we used to have where Professor Sheridan, Professor Kinnear, myself, Professor Irish, can kind of circulate and, and talk to folks more generally. So 
Um, that's happening as well. So studio check-ins definitely this week. Get those last things in the last discussions with your teaching team. Uh, and hopefully you'll enjoy tomorrow's lecture as well. Uh, the announcement also talked about um, having Q&A sessions. Uh, thus far, actually, I have to change that. I made this slide a little bit early. Uh, one person did actually show up, which is kind of better than zero, technically infinitely better than zero. And in lecture 34, uh, I mentioned that I was going to be um, online for a fairly significant number of hours on the weekend. Um, and I, I had approximately, well, slightly below 10 um, attendees. So I look at this and I say, okay, uh, we did try to run these sessions. We plan to run these sessions. Thus far, our attendance ain't so hot. So let's open it up to students, uh, everyone who's around. Um, let's take two minutes on this. 1331 goes to 1333. Uh, let's assume for the moment that we should increase the number of attendees. What can we do to increase the number of attendees? Two minutes, charge. Let's see if I can do what I want here. This should work. And then stop. And then, haha, -ha, it's working. <clears throat> the timer's up now. All right, I'm just taking a look at things. Bing, bing. <laughs> okay, this, this one I'm going with immediately. Uh, I'm not thinking about doing your CSC homework for you. to redirect breath, tell her other props to chill out, okay. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sharing this one too. I'm not sure increasing your stress levels about this course so that you feel more obligated is necessarily the best call. Um, make it worth a percentage of marks. Eh, I... Uh, eh. Um, advise that TAs would be giving advice. So it sounds like, um, that's a neat one. Uh, it sounds like be more explicit about the specific topics. You know, like from 12 to 1, it's handbook. From 1 to 2, it's detailed design. 2 to 3, it's verification. Okay, so, oh, here we go. Timer is done. Are you guys having flashbacks now? Having flashbacks? All right. Oop, wrong one. Uh, we're going to hide. Where's the go away? I don't need that anymore. All right. Um, so number of options. Um, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to um, cancel the CRNCR. Um, chat email me times. Okay. Giving us mark. Yeah, is, I think wrong thing. Ah, so so I, I like there's a discussion on the discord that basically says the goal was to increase attendance at all costs. Well, if, if all costs includes, um, you know, changing things. And I think then there's some good good discussion, uh, mindset versus attendance. Okay. Um, so here's what I'm going to put on the table. Um, I might as well write this down. So I'm going to put on the table uh, two things. One is pick a starting platform. in the sense that, okay, everybody go to Blackboard Collaborate as your start. Uh, Foster may be in different spots, but the, the teaching team will be there. And two, um, more specific in shorter chunks. I should say shorter, come on, shorter chunks. So saying, okay, from one to two, this, from two to three, this. 
Um, I'm not saying we're only going to be on BBC, but I think that's a starting point, and then we can move that one around. Anyway, that's the proposal. Um, and then we have some other counterpoints. Keep the discussion happening. This was sort of proposals. Okay, and save, because we're saving. All right, uh, 35 after, onwards. All right, there are, depending on how you count, between eight and eight and a half days left, uh, there are 37%. We're gonna talk about a few things in the last 25 minutes before tomorrow. So, uh, thinking back, uh, we showed you this, and we introduced a couple of concepts, and in particular, this notion of technical debt. And I kind of alluded to this idea of, okay, where the hackers just look, it was there, did what I needed. The engineer at least said, well, okay, but there are consequences. And that as an engineer, you want to, um, 35 minutes in is vote on, on, on par for us, thank you very much. Um, you're gonna want to actually understand the decisions you're making. So we'll do our usual thing, bring up Google, and we'll search for technical debt and what shows up pretty quick is this. And so, I, as you know, I'm kind of a fan of these, these, these two-dimensional quadrant-based models. And so on, on the left, we have going from accidental to deliberate. I wonder if this is useful. Um, so we've got going accidental to deliberate that way, and you've got reckless to prudent. Excuse me. So I will put on the table the purpose of your education in engineering design is fundamentally go that way. Praxis and engineering basically says we need you definitely to transition from accidental to deliberate. It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be correct. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in ways that we think are prudent. Uh, that's coming up. In ways that we agree with but at least be deliberate in your actions. Necessary, but not sufficient to be an engineer is to be deliberate. Boom, done, like. Now, with that said, in praxis, yeah, you know, if you want to be prudent, we like prudent, if you wanna be reckless, it's not necessarily us, but if those are your values, if you're like, I am, I am between 18 or 17 and, and 19 years old, biologically recklessness is built into my, my 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 place in my growth okay just be deliberately reckless please if you're like nope where i come from my background my positionality is very much more about prudence then do that but no matter what you gotta go up personally i'm into the right but you know that goes on so but this notion of technical debt is basically caused by the so the cause of it are these attitudes and these approaches to doing your work. Okay, so let's go back. Um, and then got this nice one. Uh, it started in software, but the idea is that there's going to be a cost of rework, cost of going back and fixing by going for easy, and I'm a little hesitant on easy. How about a less appropriate solution now instead of using a better approach? Um, and would take longer, again, so Wikipedia is not doing so hot here. Um, so let's, let's fix it a little bit. So using a better approach, so using, choosing and take out easy, choosing a, work caused by choosing an expedient versus easy, using a better approach that would require additional resources. But fundamentally, that, that's, that's what technical debt is. It's this idea that we went expedient, there's gonna be long-term costs, but we go with it anyway. Uh, yes, accessible would be, yes, yes. Okay, um, so we can zip it down a little bit. Um, I kind of like this other one from C2 Wiki. Um, it's those things that you choose not to do now, but if you don't ever get around to them, will eventually block or at least have a lot, add friction to your progress. And this, 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 choose. It is, we believe, I believe, this is Foster's positionality. Technical debt is totally fine. Taking on debt is an okay thing, except if it's to raccoons on that island game. I'm not cool with the raccoon debt lords in the island game. But anyway, you choose to take on technical debt 
versus just taking it on because you don't know. Okay, so we talked about minimum viable product. I'm watching the clock, it's gonna get fun. Um, and this idea of, of, you know, you iterate, you go from, from happy products all the way through versus incomplete. Okay, so let's bring in this technical debt thing and this notion of deliberate, accidental, reckless, imprudent. And then just to make this really tactical and personal for you, let's bring in ESC 190 in your programming assignments. Because as I watch people asking questions, what I get a feeling for is that people kind of get caught in a technical debt situation and it's really difficult to convince yourself that the best thing to do is to, to pay down the debt or literally toss the code. So the goal is to balance, right? You don't wanna just set everything up so you're only done at the end. So minimum viable is useful, but technical debt can accumulate very quickly when you're minimally viable because you start to make decisions based on earlier things. So two minutes on the clock, thinking through this balance and contextualizing it perhaps into ESC 190, strategies that you can come up with for yourselves because there are no global ones for balancing MVP iteration with accumulating technical debt, two minutes on the clock and go. Two minutes on the clock, come on, and start, and show. All right, some things starting to come in. Set an upper limit on the iterations. Debug as you go, I like it. Um, I think this, this is a good one, I've seen it. Um, know as many factors that can cause it and then plan around. The challenge is that nobody teaches you to look ahead, which is really difficult, right? People aren't taught what I'm gonna call defensive programming in the sense of they're not taught by doing this, you're saving yourself later. Set a time frame, stop. Who says you've got to stay faithful to the original code base? I disagree. At this point, I am so tempted to get my hands on a Sigourney Weaver quote just to be difficult. Uh, focus on learning, understanding, instead of getting it to work. Oh, nice. And, and debugging along the way. So, so you make sure that the understanding and the debugging are happening. Awesome. <laughs> okay, now we're getting into memory allocation jokes. All right, uh, Professor Sheridan, I'd like to see if we can get a poll in, um, effectively almost a, a, a yes, no, true, false-ish one on, have you ever of your own choice started an ESC 190 assignment from scratch, having already, you know, basically, have you thrown out something in ESC 190, complete throw out, start from, start, start fresh. All right, so let's see if we can get a poll on that. Um, as mom and dad are fighting and matter most apparently. Oop, don't want that one. We're gonna hide that one. Okay, so a number of strategies came up um, and we'll see how many of you have like got the self-discipline, but I think you, you came up with a lot and it's all about you, right? This is handbook. This, this, I'm, gonna, I'm just putting this out there. I'm gonna use the term. This is handbook. I use the term bait. I'm never sure if the term bait is a good term or not, but like this is the kind of thing you want to put in your handbook. How do you balance these two competing things? In fact, as a general statement, how you personally What? That should be showing up. Okay, my writing isn't working. We'll post it regardless. Thank you, Practice Pull It Beer for letting me know. Um, what I'm writing is basically handbook bait. How do you pers? Oh, I know what's going on. Aha, hold on, we got it, we got, we got this. Bingo, should be up now. How do you personally balance 
dot, dot, dot. Whether it's MVP with technical debt, whether it's research and um, like that, that is what goes in your handbook. How do you navigate the tensions of engineering design? And I have 15 minutes. Um, I'm, 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 oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. We're going to do this. I'm going to try not to go long. I will fail. Um, okay. So last time, last time, um, I showed you this. If you wish to, please load this up as we go. Otherwise, don't. But you can get the, the link in the slides. Um, alternatively, you can download SolveSpace from GitHub. Um, it's pretty old. It says December 16th. Um, and the question is, are we going to get to the assignments? We're going to try. But they're less important. This is cool. Being suppressed. Um, Mac OS Catalina doesn't really work with 2.3. Um, so for those of you who are curious, why is Foster about to show us this thing? Um, when you've got things like SolidWorks or, or FreeCAD, um, it's because I want to introduce you to this idea of parametric drawing. And solve space is a very narrow scoped uh, particular, uh, is, a, is a narrowly scoped tool that really specializes only in parametric drawing. And I want to show you the power of thinking this way. Because it's like, to me, this is one of the, this is engineering in a very tactical way. So here we go. Uh, so what we asked, um, if someone asks you, and notice it's write the code to draw a rectangle, how do you think about solving it? And maybe we'll, we'll change the question slightly. What's your mental model? Like how do, when you think rectangle, how do you think rectangle? So we're gonna just take, take a minute. It's like, if I say rectangle, how do you think if you had to code up writing a rectangle, like drawing a rectangle on screen, how would you do it? Take a minute. Okay, elongated square, but now you got square. So, okay, angles, angles seem to be a thing. All right, sounds easy, but but just just how are you gonna make sure it stays a rectangle? Okay, vertex positions, I got vertex positions. Geometric definition, but in programming, I think in terms of coordinates. Okay, that, that, okay, we're gonna come to that. That is like, that is, that, yes. Okay, um, one corner vertex plus length plus width, okay. Um, by the way, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you, you noticed that there was an entire uh, detailed design decision on the composition of concrete. Just saying. Okay, there's our timer. And I've got a kick out of that. Nope, kick out of that and switch back in. Okay, so number of people wrote a number of different things. Um, what I think the big one is the person who said geometric metric in general, but coordinates, I'll put verses here, coordinates, in code. So four-sided polygon, okay, wait, four-sided polygon, pair of lines offset by a distance, I like that. We have one corner vertex length and widths, okay. Uh, go check out your linear algebra in a minute, like hold off for like 12 minutes on linear algebra. Because um, if you think about it, line segments are usually considered point, so I can just, I can define a line as that which connects x1, y1, x2, y2. And then as long as I make, you know, for example, if this is A and this is B, then I can have, I should be, I will make that xA, ya1. Okay, my notation sucks. But you get the idea. xB1, yB1. So, on the one hand, you can think about the coordinates directly and you can say, okay, or you can think about the geometry and someone's having bad flashbacks. Here's where this goes horribly wrong and here we go. I am now gonna shift into solve space and I'm gonna draw a line, drawing a line. 
I have a line. It has an endpoint, has another endpoint. It even knows where the endpoints are. We're all good to go. So how about, whoop, whoop, escape, ah. Okay, the web doesn't work the same way as the other stuff. There we go. So I'm gonna draw a couple lines. Okay, all right, folks, how do I make this into a rectangle? What do I do to make this into a rectangle? Geometrically, what has to happen now? Anybody? Connect them together. Okay, connect what? Okay, less on 185 people, come on. Connect them together, connect what together? The vertices, okay. So here's what I'll do. I'll select these two vertices and I will constrain them together. So now no matter what I do, oh, you go away, you're not there yet. Be gone. Oop. I have constrained these points to be coincident. Hold on, I haven't got to the, I haven't got to the normal of the intersections yet. And I can do the same here, point, point, whoop. point, point, on point. Okay, what am I selecting around? Okay, too many things selected. Point, red, red, on. And we'll do one more. Clean things up a little bit. Okay, so now I've connected these things together and I can move them around and the lines have to be normal. So I'll do that one and that one, constrain them to be perpendicular. And I will select that one and that one and constrain them to be perpendicular. So those two are perpendicular and those two are perpendicular, ah, crap. Uh, let's do one more perpendicular. And now I have something <laughs> presented with some twist that relates it to praxis. Yes, you're right. Uh, I can also make that horizontal. And now I've set it up. Notice I did not do any calculations. Notice I did not figure out where the points are. I have something that's guaranteed to be a rectangle, not because I did the math, but because I declared the geometric constraints. I have coincident points, I have perpendiculars, and I have horizontals. Once I do that, I'm done. I don't have to do any more math, it's guaranteed no matter what I do to be correct. Parallelogram, I could do the same thing by declaring things to be horizontal. So this is called parametric modeling. And the critical part here is, well, on the one hand, you could use a script for it, but what I just showed you, and here's the big tie, David Leong, you think about the concept, not the implementation. The concept is perpendicular or coincident. You then run what's called a constraint solving algorithm, which is graph theory and linear algebra, which is what you've been using and learning in ESC 190 and in MAT 185. The code solves for all the positional locations and sets it up. So you don't waste your time with the details of the implementation. You declare the concepts and the constraints. And that is why it's so powerful because you specify real world behaviors and allow your tools to do the work for you. So I showed you this because one, I promised I would, and two, because it's a way to bring together representational stuff from Praxis. How do you draw? How do you solve model? How do you sketch? And the theory you're learning in ESC 190 and MAT 185, 
and it gives you a different way of understanding how you would solid model. Rather than calculating points, rather than doing things directly, you declare constraints and constraints are understanding and you let the math and the technology solve the details. We have five minutes to go. Um, again, that was a, I promised and I wanted to get there. And it, to me personally, that is the coolest thing ever. Cause I remember sketching things on graph paper by hand and it sucked. All right, five minutes. These are out. We're just gonna summarize a few points. Discourse is there for you. Let's move on. Detailed design decisions. We've said you have to refine your concepts, right? But they still have to be structured and rigorous as you define these details. So as you go from the six line bridge, down, 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 down to the screw with a cheese head and a Robertson driver, every one of those all the way down is structured and rigorous. So we showed you a bunch of different examples. And I think uh, my personal favorite is the type and ratio of aggregate and binder in the concrete. Screen, screen, bring back the screen, change the slide. Aha, thank you, sorry, I got caught up. There we are. All right, quick check, are we okay? So just quickly, uh, going back, this idea of refinement, this idea of continuing with rigor. Okay. Um, we talked about some examples, as we say, concrete aggregate microcontroller. Um, again, we're looking for a technical engineering decision, science, math, technology, similar kinds of tools. And we acknowledge that given the circumstances, a lot of research, perhaps all research, and that's fine. Flipping forward. All right, let's just, let's just trigger everybody for lack of a better word. Uh, rigor, rigor is still there. Also that your assessor there, now you know, 10 to 15 minutes to assess and evaluate, and they're not gonna be, excuse me, a technical expert on what you're up to. So constraints. Notice that there's on the decision and there's on the submission. Decision, it makes sense, should be for something from the one pager, the conceptual design there, and should, as you did in the PER, have quantitative and qualitative, but we double shoulded just in case. And the submission is going to be a presentation where you record yourself presenting slides. And we provide some mechanisms for doing that in the assignment. And we'll go over those a little bit um, in a different context. All right, so the criteria, almost identical to the ones from the PER. Requirements, alternatives, and process, followed by the representational communication, your arguments, claim and evidence is still there, your presentation, structure and introduction, and your visual and oral and written communication. Sorry, written visual and oral communication in English. So that's what we're looking for. This is a critical point. And so it's a bunch to read goes like this. Sometimes you're gonna start working on your detailed design decision and you're gonna be like, ugh, this is actually surprisingly hard. I'm not finding the resources I need, things aren't, I can't find reference designs, I can't find candidates, the framing is kind of more than I can get into. Um, so what we're gonna say is if you start to hit that point where you're investing a lot of time and not getting the return you're hoping for, then talk to us as soon as possible. So as it says, I'll just re-highlight it, If you find yourself significant effort without minimal return, talk to us. We will suggest other ways of doing things. We don't want you in a situation where you have to throw things out. We don't want you to work, work, work and toss. Not fair to you, not the goal. Again, keep on discourse, asking questions. The detailed design decision, PR, very, very similar. I got 30 seconds. I'm gonna try not to go over time because I hear other people do that. Verification, right? You've had to estimate, lots of estimates over time. As you progress, as you do your detailed design work, you're also getting higher fidelity prototypes and you're trying to reduce those estimates. You're trying to do formal testing, get better measurements. I think we're gonna go about a minute or two over time. That's the goal here is to take 
measurements and esti or take estimates and turn them into measurements as best as you can. So a couple different pieces to this. It's 14 hours. Give me about a minute and a half. It's my estimate here. Um, measurement system that makes sense under your circumstance. Prototypes that make sense given that measurement system. Actually do the measurements. And then number four is make sure that the stuff you're doing is direct or research-based. We're acknowledging that you might have to do research, analyze, and present. So the constraints are absolutely identical. Criteria are slightly different. We're looking for your measurement system, given what you have and what you're targeting, your prototypes, given your measurement system and your concepts, and the analysis. And that includes a little bit of error analysis in your measurement system, which we believe we were told you've done. And um, we told you did that in physics and hopefully you remember how and we'll support you as necessary. And then the rest is identical. So with that, um, as far as we can tell, uh, we think you have everything you need to succeed on the 37. The IETs are the one piece that's missing. They're coming soon. And we are ready to help you in studio, in discourse, in drop-in sessions. We are going to throw ourselves into places where you can access us. Our goal is for you to get the absolute highest grades possible while learning as much as you can. And we will see you in lecture, possibly with Goku, possibly with an abusive sergeant, tomorrow. Have a good one, everyone.